Hey everybody, my name is Wayne Baker and I'm one of the staff therapists at Affair Recovery. And last week we opened up a discussion about the main reasons why to stop in an affair. And this week we're just going to continue with part two, so I'm just going to jump right in. The next reason to stop in an affair is <clears throat> because it's an issue of an integrity. And the American College of Dictionary defines integrity as the soundness of moral principle and character uprightness and honesty. If you put that definition at play here, infidelity is not about integrity. It's about compromising what we know to be right. Most likely, I can't tell you anything that you don't already know. All I can do is speak to the truth that you do already know. And what we know to be true and right lies at the very core of who we are, of our being, and it just feels unacceptable. We're afraid that if we follow that standard, we'll never be happy. So instead of following what we know to be right, we begin to search for ways to get around what stands between us and what we want to do. We reveal the existence of truth, of hiding our actions. Why else do we keep these actions secret? If we truly believe that what we are doing is right and good, and then why do we fear exposure? Integrity is about doing the right thing and following what we know to be true, even when no one is watching, especially when no one is watching. And anything short of doing what we know is right never works. Self-centeredness is at the core of compromise, and that is not about love. Anything short of doing what we know is right never does work. The self-centeredness at the core of that compromise is not about loving others, and it's certainly not really about loving ourselves, because I think in a betrayal, even before you betray your spouse, you betray yourself. But this is based on selfishness and pride, and is a force that will destroy all of us, um, and especially those that we love. Another reason to, to end an affair is that affairs result in less intimacy not more intimacy. Most people who I've worked with over the years um, claim that it's easier to be intimate with an affair partner when the, with their spouse. But in reality, it's really like comparing apples to oranges. Intimacy is the ability to be totally transparent, to be known fully by another person. In Genesis 2.25, there's this closing verse that's, that ends like the two were naked and felt no shame. This is a great definition of intimacy in my opinion because it's where two people come together and they can fully be present with each other um, and there's no shame. All their dreams, their hopes, their fears, their love, their mistakes, and their positives as well as their negatives. The intimacy of an affair, of a couple dating, is really just about validating each other. In a relationship that's based on validation, partners feel that it's safe to share what they think and what's important because they agree on almost everything. You know that when you first started dating even your spouse or you dated other people. Everybody's on their best behavior at the beginning. All these important issues and even, or even the ones they can't agree on they're at the least able to come to the point where they can agree to disagree without much effort at all. Outside of a marriage, it's easy to embrace differences. And lastly, if a relationship is based on validation, it's highly unlikely that either one of you will ever really grow or mature beyond where you are right now. Marriage or long-term committed relationships that are not in secret radically changes that dynamic. Once we cross into the marital relationship, there's this paradigm shift. Now, instead of two individuals searching for ways that their differences complement each other, they feel the pressure to become one. And most married people begin to define the quality of their relationship with their ability to be on the same page, to agree on issues, to see things the same way, and to be who their mate needs them to be. When there is a difference, instead of drawing the couple closer, it creates tension and pushes them apart. Almost every couple I've ever worked with goes through this, and same here. Each time someone 
reveals who they are, it's different than their mate believes them to be. It creates this tension, and each time they disagree on an important issue, they're threatened, and they're afraid that they will never have a life the way they wanted it to be, the way it used to be. And inside marriage, intimacy becomes this self-validating, and it takes a lot of integrity and a lot of courage and personal strength to share fully who you are, to show up and be present with somebody that you're totally opposite to. To be authentic, even when the other may not approve. Paradoxically, that intimacy in marriage generally does not create immediate closeness. However, if you stick with it, um, you, in the long run, you, it can lead to more growth, more maturity, more love, truer intimacy, and this long-lasting bond and connection. Affairs and sex addiction are like drugs. When I have a headache, I will take an ibuprofen. I, I don't want to walk around or sit around with a headache all day. Um, I do it to avoid that pain. In fact, I think it's one of our core values of our culture and our country is this comfort we're all looking for. I just had this conversation earlier today with a client in my office about his need to feel comfort. And what we do is we consume drugs to avoid both physical and emotional pain. To many of us, it feels as normal as breathing. And as a result, we lose the notion of how to live life with a little discomfort. We've lost the ability to tolerate pain. And in some aspects, those involved in sexual addiction and affairs use their behavior as a sedative, as a way of escaping some of those deeper, darker hurts or wounds or traumas that we all have. Sexual addiction creates this powerful biochemical rush that in many ways is similar to the controlled substances and becomes one of our drugs of choice. Another reason to stop an affair is that you might think you're a good fortune teller, but you're not. We all failed that class. People rationalize an affair with ideas like, my family doesn't deserve to have to put up with me. I just did a Q&A on this not 15 minutes ago on this very thing. Or another one is that I'm too dangerous. I'm so better off having the affair. Um, or my family is better off if I have the affair and I leave. Truthfully, those ideas come from this victim mentality that is so prevalent in our culture as well. It's not your place to make that call for other people. Their happiness is not on you. Happiness is not one of the goals of marriage. It's, it's about commitment. It's about growing up. It's about living the promises that we made to one another once upon a time. If your mate were to leave and to go be with someone else, he or she may or not be better off. We don't know, because when you marry a set of problems, um, you, you don't marry a different set. And if you leave this set, you go get another set of problems. Consequently, I mean, how, how do you measure what is better off anyway? Maybe a lifetime of marriage with you might help develop them with grace and mercy. Maybe it's just the right environment for growth for both of you. Um, so you're not a good fortune teller. With, I, with those ideas that come like that, that they don't deserve um, this pain that you're putting them through. Only God knows. So the next reason to stop an affair is that your actions will not result in long-term happiness, love, or acceptance. One of the core beliefs of those involved in affairs is that they deserve to be loved and that they deserve to be loved perfectly. The truth is though, that we're all imperfect beings, and no matter how good we think we are, it's never good enough. Consequently, in this imperfect state that we're all in, we will always fail to respond perfectly to those that, that love us and to those that we love. Just as we ask ourselves these questions, so do they. What do other people want from us? Don't they want love and acceptance? How long can either party go before the pressures of life squeezes us and causes us both to fail in our expressions of love and acceptance for, for one another? At, at that moment, do they deserve to be loved? 
And are they easy to love? If not, are they able to sense your frustration with them? And do they begin to feel inadequate and unloved? If you fail at loving them perfectly, are they likely to begin to withdraw from you, only to leave you feeling alone and unacceptable and unworthy? I firmly believe that the pursuit of personal happiness, love, or acceptance in marriage will end up in the same place. It will end up in frustration and failure every time. My suggestion is to quit looking at the wrong source and discover what marriage or long-term committed relationships are really all about. They're about our growth, about our maturity, about connection, about commitment. Um, every couple can have that conversation is what is all this about? But I think you're going to find something like that. It's not about happiness. Happiness comes and goes. Uh, but those other things can remain. And, you know, life has its bumps. Like we say all the time in recovery work, we deal with life on life's terms. So looking at it through that lens might be helpful too. Another reason to stop an affair is uh, to think through what you're doing to get some wise counsel and slow down. Because over the years, I've had clients who wanted me to talk them out of an affair. Uh, just last week, there was a woman in my office that came in and wanted me to talk her out of something. And, and here's the thing, the circumstances can change. I've been doing this for a long time. Marriages of various number of years, kids, good jobs, good community. Um, they meet someone and then they think they fall in love. Spouses then know nothing about the affair, what's going on in secret, but they might be and probably are aware of some marital issues. Now the, the one that's having an affair is about to give everything up for someone that they are just sure is their soulmate. I've seen this thousands of times in my career as a therapist. And here's the thing, their affair partner is most likely in the same predicament with a family and a career and kids, um, that everything is now on the line. So these two people come together, they've met online or they've met at the office and after just a few months, they're ready to leave their marriage. In reality, it's impossible to know someone in just a few months. It's certainly difficult to determine whether a person will be alike, what they'll be like in marriage based on how they acted in a secret courtship when everyone is putting their best foot forward. Affairs are often fueled by miserable marriages where the marital def deficits are used to justify an infidelity. And we all know that we, everybody rewrites history. So maybe the marriage wasn't miserable, but there were some deficits in there. But to the one that's, been a, that's being unfaithful, they've probably blown these deficits to a greater degree so that instead of a little skirmish, it feels like thermonuclear war to them. So if that's the case, that makes the majority of affairs just this reactive in nature. Why choose a man or a woman who is willing to betray their spouse? And this goes both ways. Talk about out of the frying pan and into the fire. Who we have an affair with is never an independent, rational, sense-making decision, but rather a reaction to being squeezed by life and life circumstances. In an affair, your lover is most likely not someone you would choose if you were single and on your own. If that were true, then I would say get a divorce, be single for a year, and then see if you would still want that person. Nobody's ever taken me up on that. But, but we know that less than 10% of all affairs end up in long-term committed relationships because they're not based in reality. Another reason to stop an affair is that sometimes God will say something and it doesn't really need to make sense to me or to you. One of the primary reasons I began work with affairs stemmed from my own, my own marital unfaithfulness 25 years ago. I was haunted by what I had done. I told my best friend one afternoon, he asked me right off the bat, well, Wayne, what, what's God telling you to do? And I, that stopped me in my tracks. 
And I just asked that quick question. And immediately I heard this voice come clean, be honest uh, with yourself and with your wife. So I told him that and he said, yeah, that sounds good to me. And I was just flabbergasted. I was like, but but that doesn't make sense to me because why would I inflict so much pain on her because of my failure and because of my stupid mistakes? My friend then asked me, he said, well, if God says it, why does it need to make sense to you? I'm asking you to ask God, what should I do here? Um, and if God is telling you, if he's the one directing, the creator of everything, does it need to make sense to us? Could it be he already knows the outcome of all of this? I told my wife and we began the recovery journey. And she's often said that she'd never go back and do that again, want to do that. But what was the worst thing in our life turned out to be one of the best things of our life because Number one, we both had to face some issues in our own childhood and some of the baggage and the wounds that we had brought to our marriage and, and the, the bad patterns of relating that we, um, we were entrenched in by that point in time. I had to do some 12-step work. I did a ton of individual work. We did a bunch of couples work. Truly, I believe she was right on that the worst thing can become one of the best things, the most growth and challenging things. So I also challenge you, if you haven't already heard what God is saying, then ask. And I tell people this, keep asking, and ask and ask and ask until you hear Him. Also be willing to hear what He's saying without an agenda. Another reason to stop an affair is that your spouse is not your problem. You hear us say that all the time, so stop blaming them. In Genesis chapter three, Adam and Eve are discovered having busted, uh, messed up one of God's rules. He didn't have that many for them, but you know they, they had to, to mess one of them up. And so then they were trying to protect their image by blaming each other. You know, Adam blamed Eve, Eve blamed the snake. They felt that if they could pass the blame, they could push away their bad feelings as if it was no longer their own failure they believed that subsequently they'd be able to avoid judgment and condemnation. I found that one of the most common responses to infidelity is blaming, and I, I see it every single day. Just like Adam, the closest and easiest person to blame is often one spouse. We attempt to push away our own guilt and avoid taking responsibility by focusing on our spouse's behavior and their failures and not our own. So quit blaming each other, number one, and quit blaming your spouse for your infidelity. And one more reason for today that we're gonna talk about uh, for reasons to stop an affair is that, the, that truly the truth will set you free. Just like I shared a few minutes ago about my own story, it, it was not easy at the beginning, and it was, a, it was a long, difficult road. But I will tell you this, that the truth does set you free. Jesus said it, and I've walked with other hundreds, thousands of couples through this, is that it's not easy, but, it, but freedom is there. In reality, the reward of an affair and sexual addiction is more bondage, not freedom. It's a trap that will consume you, and those of you that are trapped in it, you know what I'm talking about. There's no freedom in lies generated by the behavior. It never ceases to amaze me at this double message generated by people involved in extramarital affairs or sexual addiction. The infidelity would seem to indicate that they want out of the marriage, but then their efforts to hide the behavior indicates that they want to protect the marriage. It's this, this back and forth. By maintaining the lies, it's impossible to discover what's true. Consequently, we avoid confronting the issues in our marriage. We avoid discovering if our mate has enough love to still choose us after we betray them. However, when we begin to speak the truth, the pressure is finally lifted away. We deal with our shame, we deal with our guilt, we deal with our fear when we just begin to express our truth. And I think I have this belief that when we don't do that, it's because our eyes are not on our maker. 
Our eyes are on other people for approval and for acceptance. So we don't share, especially with our spouse, when they've hurt our feelings or when they've wounded us or stressed us out because we don't want to rock the boat. All the research shows that it's the conflict avoidance that is the number one predictor of divorce and affairs. So sharing your tooth, truth about what you've done, about uh, later on, about other deficits in the marriage really do begin to set us free or free to begin to face life on life's terms. We say that in recovery work all the time and free to just be who God created you to be. Others may or may not be able to accept us or even like us for what we've done. But when we begin to speak the truth, they're free to respond with the knowledge that they've been given. We no longer have to carry that heavy burden of controlling their response. Because then if we're trying to control their response, and this comes in so many different areas of our life, even outside of infidelity, you will never know if you are truly loved if you're trying to control people's response. The freedom will never come as a result of our betrayal. It can only come as we move into the truth. So I think that's enough for today. Um, I'm gonna finish this series next week and I hope that this part two has helped you both cope and understand with the enormity of, a, of an affairs implication. And if, if you're ready and willing to move to the next level of recovery, I'd like you to consider attending our EMS weekend soon. I'd love for you to join us simply to see if there's hope for your marriage. I can't promise you that there is, but couples from all over the world come attend EMS weekend every month. You don't have to be sure that your marriage can be restored or to, to attend our weekend. But maybe you need the intensive, this intensive to go deeper into the underlying issues and discover whether it truly is over. And if there's in fact hope, I hope you will join us at a, a weekend. Um, that would be so good to see you and to meet you and um, to see what work can be done. So thanks for joining me today, and I look forward to seeing you again next week. Thanks so much.